Uh, I heard about this old cowboy. Uh, he went to church and he wore his old jeans and an old wore out shirt and a hat uh, and uh, some boots that should have been thrown away. They came in and sat through the message. And as he was going out, the preacher said, uh, son, you think you'll be coming back? Yeah, he said, I think so, preacher, next week, probably. And he said, well, in the meantime, would you ask God what you ought to wear here? Yeah, yeah, he said, I sure will, preacher, I'll ask him. So he came in next week dressed the same way. And uh, he said, I thought you was going to ask God about what to wear. Oh, he said, I did, preacher, I sure did, spent some time in asking him. He said, what did he say? He said, he didn't have any idea, he had never been here. <laughs> yeah. Did you know that the Spirit of God left Samson and he wist not? He wist not that he was gone. I wonder if that's happened to some of our churches. I wonder if it's happened to some of us. We just make motions anymore. We just go three things that we know about. Is really the Spirit of God working in our lives today? Is he working in our churches today? I wonder how many are here tonight. Would you lift your hand if you're here? All right, good, good, amen. Uh, just, uh, <laughs> well, anyway, I better leave that one alone. But uh, tonight, I want you to turn with me, if you would, please, in the Bible, and I... Sure hope you have a Bible with you. Uh, people quit bringing their Bibles, and the preacher started saying whatever they wanted to, and nobody knew if it was right or not that, that what was going on. Uh, and uh, so I want you to have your Bible with you, and I want to read you this evening, and it'll be the whole crux of my message tonight. It's in Luke and chapter 6. Many of you, or maybe all of you, will not remember J. Sidlow Baxter, the preacher from England. He used to be quite popular back in the 50s and 60s, uh, 1950 and 60. And uh, I got to hear him. And he had a very, a very uh, English voice. And, you know, they talk funny over there, you know. Uh, they think we talk funny. Uh, maybe we do. I don't know. Uh, but he got up in the pulpit that night and he said, we are, go we are going to Luke, into Luke. Uh, and so that's where we are, Luke, okay? And uh, chapter 6, and to me, I believe this is the greatest question in all of the Bible. Why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Why call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things I say? You know, people ask me, Dr. Williams, what do you think the hardest thing in the world to get Christians to do? I said, to do. Just to do. Just to do. Just to do. If everybody in this building tonight would do what you know to do, you couldn't seat the crowd. If you just do what you know to do. It isn't that you don't know to do. If there's an informed people, I'm speaking to them. Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord? And don't do the things that I tell you. Our Father, tonight, in the next few moments, would you take these lips of clay and use them one more time? I pray you will, and you'll flow upon this crowd tonight and all those who are live streaming all over the country tonight. I told people about it, and they're live streaming tonight, and I'm sure there's a great live stream crowd uh, for the services of this church anyway. But, Father, speak to people. Speak to people tonight, wherever they are. 
Help them to stop and you speak to them, we pray. In Jesus' blessed name and for his glorious sake, we pray it all with thanksgiving. Amen. Amen. All right. Tonight, I want to, you to keep thinking about this question while I speak tonight. Why do I call him Lord? Am I really keeping his word? Am I really doing what he wants me to do? Am I going where he wants me to go? Am I saying what he wants me to say? Am I really serving him? You know, the 120 maybe of the greatest Christians that ever lived were in an upper room in Acts chapter 1. Do you know how long it took 120 of the greatest Christians maybe that ever lived to agree? Ten days. There's nothing magic about the ten days. But when they all were in one accord, the Spirit came. You know what God's waiting on in this church? The church where we go? Your church? He's waiting for us all to get in one accord. One accord. Notice, if you would, tonight. Let, let, me, let me just take a little while tonight to introduce you to the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you say those words? Lord Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ. I hear too many people call him, yeah, Jesus. No, he's the Lord Amen. Jesus Christ. Amen. One of the things that has de deteriorated in this country, uh, you know, Nobody calls the president the president anymore. I don't care if you like him or don't like him. He's the president. And these newscasters talk about him like he's a kid down on the street somewhere. The Bible says give honor to whom honor is due. Mm -hmm. Yeah, pretty good, Brother Williams. Now... Take your Bible, turn to Matthew 12, please. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 6. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 6. But I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. But I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. Don't ever... Don't ever, don't ever think this building is more important than the God it was erected about. The Lord Jesus Christ is supposed to live here in our hearts, our lives. This isn't a holy building. They bought the materials to build this building at the same place the bar bought their material. God's not here till we get here. He doesn't live at church. He lives in us. Amen. Quit pulling the shades at home. He'll look right through them. Yeah. You, know, you know how we can have instant revival? Just take a look at all the cell phones that are in this building right now. Huh? Hey. God knows what's on your cell phone. God knows what's on your computer. Jesus Christ, God's son, knows about it also. He's sitting right next to his father, and they do talk. Yeah, yeah, brother. <laughs> did you know stone? Did you know rocks talk? Huh? Jesus said, if you don't praise me, the rocks will. Is that what he said? That's what he meant. Did, did you ever look at the story uh, of David killing Goliath? You know, he stopped and he got five smooth stones out of the little creek down there and he put them in this goat skin bag he had on his side and he got his slingshot, not a 30 alt 6 with a scope. 
uh, he got this slingshot out and he put a stone in it and he got out there and he ran toward Goliath. He ran toward him, the Bible says. It wasn't a fear in that young man's heart, about 15, maybe 16 years old. And he's running right toward this giant 10 feet tall uh, and about 620 pounds uh, and a weaver's beam, that's a four by four, was in his hand and the spearhead weighed 35 pounds and he held that thing just like it was nothing and he could chunk it like we would a rock uh, and David's running right toward him. And uh, you know, he, he got that rock in that sling. D did, did you ever figure out what those other four rocks were doing? You know what they were doing? Get him, rock! <laughs> Don't you give us rocks a bad name! Get him, rock! Get that giant! The only sad part about that story, they weren't fundamental rocks. <laughs> fundamental rocks would have been saying, why didn't he use me? Why don't you let God use who he wants to? <laughs> you know, the Lord Jesus is coming down the, the Jer Jericho Road, and here's blind Bartimaeus, and he wants to see, and Jesus invites him out to the middle of the road, and he gets out there, and he said, what, you want, what do you want me to do? He said, I, I want you to heal me. I want to, I want to see. And so Jesus said, you can see. And he could see. Jesus leaves there, goes 15 miles up the road to Jerusalem, and there's a guy up there that is blind, and he wants to see. And he gets up there, and so he says, you want to see? Yeah, I do. So Jesus, now this is in your Bible, hang on. Hark. <laughs> and then he reaches down and gets it and mixes it with some dirt, makes some clay mud, and he smears it on the guy's eyes, and he said, now walk all the way down in the city of Jerusalem, down to the pool down there, and wash your face in the water of Siloam, and you will see. People say, Brother Williams, why, why, why didn't he... Why, why didn't he just say, you could see, like he did to Bartimaeus? Now, I'm going to give you two or three truths tonight. Uh, hang on to them. Get a hold of your chair. This is one of them. He didn't want to. <laughs> now, the sad part is this. If those two guys would have met up with each other, one of them had said, were you blind? Yes, sir, I was blind all my life. See, bar means son of, and Timaeus means blind man. He was the son of a blind man. He said, yes, sir, I've been blind all my life. He said, how come you can see? Well, he said, Jesus came by, and he just said, I could see, and I could see. Wasn't Jesus? Jesus goes. <laughs> Brother Williams, how do you know he went? Hark. Did you ever try to get enough spit to make a mud ball without going? Hark. <laughs> You'll be there all day. <laughs> and preacher, pretty soon. They'd have had two camps, the Faithites and the Mudites. <laughs> That's how stupid we are. Let God be God! And let Jesus Christ be the Son of the everlasting God. So, anyway, I better preach. Now, Greater than the temple. Do you understand? Do you understand what the temple meant to the Jews? It wasn't just a building. It wasn't just that it was the most expensive building built probably ever per square foot. 
Now, Solomon prayed this prayer. If your children go whoring and they worship idols and you scatter them all over the world, if they will look toward this building, will you hear them? He said, I will hear them. I'll keep my eyes on this building. Look, read the book of Daniel. When the king said to the king, king Darius said to Daniel, Daniel, I want you to live in the palace. He said, but king, I've got to have a special apartment. He said, the windows have to face Jerusalem. I'm talking about 600 miles away. And every day, three times, Daniel kneels down and he looks through those windows and he's looking the direction of that temple. That's how much the temple meant to the Jews. It was a place where God lived. And Jesus said, there's one here greater than the temple. Amen. Secondly, would you please turn to the book of Matthew chapter 12, and you should be there, okay? Look at verse 40. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonas. And behold, a greater than Jonas is here. Jonah was a great prophet. Jesus Christ said so. But the Sanhedrin of Israel, the supposedly godliest and smartest men in the whole land, they didn't know that. They said, no, there's never been a prophet come out of Galilee. Oh, if they would have just studied a little bit. You know that one of the most dangerous things in our churches and in our personal lives today, we're not reading out of the book what it says. We're reading into the book what we want it to say. And so we find here, if they had just studied a little bit, go over the story of Jonah sometime. And verse 1 of chapter 1, Jonah, the son of a Midiai. Now go and study about a Midiai, and you'll find out that a Midiai was a Zebulonite. And then you study a little bit about when Joshua divided the land among the 12 tribes. He started at the sea, Mediterranean Sea, and he came straight across to the Sea of Galilee. And it was so many miles wide, and that was the property of the Zebulonites. Jonah was from Galilee. There had been a prophet that came from Galilee. You know what Jesus said to that crowd? You do err because you know not the scriptures. Look, I don't need to know what the Mormons believe. I don't need to know what the Jehovah Witness teach. I don't need to know about all of the others. I just need to know this book so well, I won't believe what they believe. You need to digest this book. Now, I've never been to Bible college. I, my kids have, and I've sent a lot of students here to Howells Anderson College and all. Uh, God never called me to go to Bible college, and it's dangerous to go over there if God doesn't call you. Yeah, okay, well, Brother Williams, now. You say, Brother Williams, how'd you learn the Bible? Well, there's a teacher available 24 hours a day. His name is the Holy Spirit. And believe me, he knows this book. My son is quite a preacher. He's 67 years old now, a uh, tremendous preacher. Uh, and uh, 
He called me one day and he said, Daddy, I, I, I want to I, I preach on Jesus walking on the water. And uh, he said, the commentators don't say anything. I said, that's the way commentators are. Yep. I said, they know what I know and what I don't know. They don't know either. <laughs> and I said, sometimes they'll skip seven or eight verses and don't even apologize. He said, Dad, do, do you know? Do you know why Jesus walked on the water? I said, uh huh. I said, one day, Tim, you know how I study the Bible. I put it down on my floor in my study and I get down over it and I said, Father, this is Tom. He said, I know who it is. Uh, and he, he said, I, I said, now, I want to know this time, why did Jesus walk on the water? And he said, we've been waiting on you about that one, Tom. You know, we thought you'd have asked that a long time ago. Uh, and uh, I said, well, Father, why did he walk on the water? He said, are you ready for this one? I said, yes, sir. He said, he wanted you to know you can't get where I can't come. And that'll take you through everything you ever thought about going through. See, you tell me your wife died. I can come to your side and help you. You say your second wife died. I can come and help you. My little girl died. I can come and help you. You tell me tonight that you're eat up with cancer. I can't come. I can't come. But I have a Savior that in all points was tempted and yet without sin. And I said, I told my boy that. He said, that'll preach, Daddy. I said, yeah, amen. But notice what Jesus said. There's one greater than Jonah. Jonah was a man that God used to revive the whole city of that wickedest, wickedest city in the world at that time, Nineveh. And he sent him there, and God worked there in a great and miraculous way. And Jesus said, I tell you, there's one greater than Jonah here. And then notice, if you would please, in uh, the next verse, the queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it, for she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. Yeah. Wisest man on earth. And greater is the eternal son of the living God. The Lord Jesus Christ. I'm greater than Solomon. I'm greater than Jonah. I'm greater than the temple. And we see him here. And if Solomon, yeah, boy, I don't know. Read the dedication of the temple. Sometime it ought to bless your soul. It ought to thrill your heart. And the nations had gathered, all, every nation that Solomon ruled over. And oh, everybody that was anybody was there. And they came. And Solomon wanted everybody to see him. And he built a platform. And he walked out and got on that platform. Him. And he stood before the nation of Israel, and he stood before all these kings and queens and all of their big shots. And then he got down on his knees, lifted his hands to heaven, and prayed. Did you notice Daniel got on his knees? Did you notice Solomon got on his knees? Did you notice Peter got on his knees? Did you notice that Paul in chapter 21 down on the seashore or all them ungodly sailors were standing there watching, got down on his knees? Did you know the Lord Jesus got down on his knees? I don't know who you are tonight. I don't know how much you can write a check for and it'd be good. I don't know what you drove up in, but I can tell you this, you don't belong above his feet. We got so stinking much pride in our independent churches. It's pitiful. Where's the altar? Where's getting on our knees? Thank God for the pastor inviting everybody tonight to come kneel here to the altar. Hallelujah. 
You ought to just walk in and do that without being asked. Yeah, yeah, okay, brother. Greater than Solomon. The Queen of the South had come 2,000 miles in an open-top chariot in the heat and the weather, and she had her, wisdom, her wise men feed her and feed her all kinds of things to ask Solomon, and she was going to stump him, and she came, and she questioned him and questioned him and questioned him, and she couldn't confuse him. She couldn't bring one question that he could not answer. And the Bible tells us that she admired him so greatly, and God had given him such wisdom, but not near. His, the wisdom of Solomon is a scratch of the needle compared to the wisdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we find not only greater than Solomon, greater than Jacob, John 4, verse 12, 13. Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? And you know the story there, as the woman came up, and Jesus talked to her, and told her everything that she ever did, and he said, give me a drink. And if you will give me a drink, I'll give you a drink. And this water that Jacob gave you and that God blessed Jacob with, this well that's never run dry and it's deep and the water's cold and it's wonderful when it comes up. But I want you to know there's a water that I give that will give you everlasting life. Greater than Jacob. Greater than Jacob. I mean, he's kicking the slats. Out from, the, uh, out from under the nation of Israel. I'm greater than the temple. I'm greater than Jacob. I'm greater than Solomon. I'm greater and greater and greater. And then he says this, and oh boy, this really got them. He said, I'm greater than Abraham. That's in John chapter 8 and verse 53 to 56 and verse 58. Art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead? And the prophets are dead. Who makest thou thyself? Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father that honoreth me, of whom you say that he is your God. You have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say I know him not, I shall be a liar like you. Boy, did he stay straight, Eddie. Huh? <laughs> yeah, probably didn't have very many church members. Notice what he said. Yea, have not, you have not known him, but I know him. If I should say I know him not, I shall be a liar, liar like unto you, but I do know him. And keep his saying. Watch that now. Jesus said, I know him and I keep his sayings. I keep his sayings. I keep his sayings. And then he said this, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and was glad and Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. And boy, that blew them away. That was the end of the road for them. Abraham, oh my, you, you know, uh, if, if you're greater than Abraham. You're not 40 years, 50 years old, and you saw Abraham, and Abraham saw you. He said, I tell you, he did. And that's over in your Old Testament, uh, and, and you can read it for yourself. And Abraham has gone to sacrifice Isaac. They climbed the mountain of Moriah. And if you'll read in First Chronicles in chapter 3, you'll find out Mount Moriah of the Old Testament is Mount Calvary of the New Testament, same mountain. And, and uh, there he said, I want you to go and take your son. That boy was dead three days in his daddy's mind. He hadn't told him yet. They get there, and he unloads the burden off the donkey and puts it on his son. Just like Jesus carried the cross, he carried the wood up the mountain, and he got up there, and he told him, he said, I can't. He said I, the, you, the reason there's no lamb is God's going to provide himself a lamb. Uh, and uh, he said, Daddy, we've been out a lot of times together and sacrificed things, and, and we've come back home late at night and all of that. But, but Daddy, where's the lamb? And he said, God will provide one. 
And up the other side of that mountain, an angel was bringing that ram up there. And I'm a West Texas cowboy. Okay, I know about thorn bushes. Uh, and uh, they brought him up there, and he shoved that ram right into that thicket. And those thorns locked in behind his head, and he was very contented to stand there. Abraham pulled out the knife. He tied his son's feet, tied his son's arms like he would the front feet and back feet of the lamb. And then they stretched the lamb out across the altar. And then they would step up and straddle the lamb. And then they would reach down and get them by the wool of the head and pull that lamb's head up until their eyes met. And that meant that the jugular vein was going as tight as it could. And then they set the knife and ripped it, and the lamb bled. And Abraham had the hair of his son in his hand, and he had pulled him back like that, and their eyes met, and he reached for the knife to set it to the throat of his son. And all of a sudden, up the mountain, ma that old man looked up there and when he looked up God shoved the curtains of time open and he allowed him to see his son dying on the cross do you know what he did get a hold of your ears okay he said Jehovah Jehovah in the mountain they're going to see this. And 2,000 years later almost, they took our Savior, God's Lamb, and you know what they stuck his head in? A thorn thicket. In the very spot that Abraham looked at is the same hill, the same mountain, and the same spot that they planted the cross. And Abraham turned to Isaac and he said, we're going home together, son. Because God, son, took our place. You here tonight and saved. You're only here because the lamb shed his blood. It was a lamb in the garden that Abel slew. It was a lamb in Exodus that the Jews slew. And you can go right on down into Isaiah, and you can go on down and go on down, and you can come to the New Testament. And in what the blood of bulls and goats and heifers and lambs could not do is once and for all, has done. Greater than Abraham, greater than Solomon, greater than Jacob, greater than the temple. And then greater, boy, this, is, this really got the Jews. You know, they, they still almost worship David. In Psalm 110 and verse 1, the Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. That's the Father talking to the Son. And the Lord said unto my Lord. You see, he's greater than David. David was a man after God's own heart, but we're looking at one greater than David. We're looking at him who the Bible says is the eternal son of the living God. The Jews said to Pilate, he claims to be the son of God. He didn't only claim it, he was. Don't you dare bring him lower than he is. <laughs> Boy, now... This is really going to get the Jews greater than Moses. Greater than Moses. 
In John 5, 46, for had you believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. John 1, 45, Philip findeth Nathanael and saith unto him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Luke 24, 27, the greatest Sunday school there have ever been. He's walking along. They're walking to, to. Please don't make two men on the Emmaus road. It was a man and his wife. Cleophas was the uncle of the Lord Jesus. And your Bible very plainly tells you that Cleophas was at the cross with Mary and Mary, his his wife was Mary also, and mother of the Lord Jesus. And now they're returning home. He didn't speak to the woman. He spoke to Cleophas, his uncle. And then he went on down the road with him, and he was going to eat with him. Jesus wasn't going to spend the night with two men, okay? Mm-hmm. Real quiet now. He was spending the night with his aunt and his uncle. And then he decided to turn away. But you know what he taught them all along that seven-mile walk? He taught them, the Bible says, the Psalms and the books of Moses and out from the, all of the Old Testament law. He taught them and showed them who he is in the Old Testament. Boy, I don't understand people that don't saturate themselves with the Old Testament. You say, preacher, wait a minute, wait a minute. Did David know him? Yeah, David said, I see my Lord at the right hand of my Lord. You said, did Ezekiel know him? Yeah, he said, I see him coming in clouds of burnished gold. You say, did somebody else know him? Oh, yeah, the seventh from Adam and Enoch knew him coming with 10,000 of his saints. And you can just go on and on through the Old Testament. Oh, they knew him. I ask you tonight, do you know him? I'm not asking you if you can quote the books of the Bible. I'm not asking you if you can pass a bonehead test and get into college. I'm asking you, do you know him? You want the apostle Paul said at the end of his life, he said that I may know him. That I may know him. Do you know him? Do you know him? Do you really honestly know him? And then he really rips the cloth. He says in Psalm 110, the Lord has sworn and will not repent. In verse 4, will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Aaron and his sons had to come every year and be dedicated again and again and again and again. And they had to have an atonement day again and again. Atonement, if you break it down, it's called at one month. And that put man and God at one again. And for another whole year. And there, then he would, then next year, they got to do it again. And then the priest has to go in there and wear that robe and pull it, pull off the outer miter because it had bells on it. There was to be no sound inside of the Holy of Holies. And he'd leave that outer garment out there. And he would go in and make seven passes before the, the mercy seat. Uh, and that was only a picture of the real one in heaven where Jesus offered his blood. And he, they would come and offer the blood of the Lamb uh, there on that mercy seat underneath the wings of the seraphims. And he would pray. If God didn't I- accept it, he died right there. That's why they put a rope around the leg of the high priest when he went in there because nobody else could go in. And if he died in there, then they had to drag him out uh, and, uh, and go on with life. But here we find he, he's going in there and he's offering his blood. Seven times he passed before the mercy seat. And then he would get back out and he'd put on that outer garment and the bells would begin to tingle. 
and the people who dared to get up the earliest that morning and get the closest to the tabernacle, and you could only get so close, and they were the first ones to hear the bells, and they would hear those bells ringing, and they'd say, God has accepted. And as far back as they could hear, they would turn around to the crowd. God has accepted. And as far back as two and a half million Jews, that's a pretty good crowd. And then they'd cry back until it reached the outer limits, till everybody had heard. That's what we're supposed to do. Till everybody has heard. Till everybody has heard. And you know what we're supposed to cry out? Redeemed! Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. God help us if we don't get back to regularly preaching on the blood of Jesus Christ. We got these modern versions and they say, well, we'll just substitute death in the place of blood. And 16 times they re replaced blood with death. I want you to know if he died with an arrow, if he died from poison, if he died from a stab to knife, if he died from a sickness, he wasn't my savior. My savior, blood had to be spilt. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So now he's better than Aaron. He's better than Moses. He's better than David. He's better than Jacob. He's better than Solomon. He's better than the temple. Read, read the book of Hebrews chapter 1. Better than angels. Chapter 3, better than Moses. Chapter, or Joshua, better. Chapter 4, he's better than Moses. And you move right on through, and you'll come down to chapter 7, and he's better, he's better, he's better than Melchizedek. You know why? He's just better. He's just better. I'm so glad the preacher led us in Bill Gaither's song, Jesus. Jesus. Just something about that name. Aren't you glad his name wasn't Mephibosheth? <laughs> Mephibosheth, Mephibosheth. Boy, that don't even make music, huh? But Jesus? Ha, <laughs> ha, If I could just sing, but if I did, the crowd would go somewhere. Now, here's the true humility of our blessed Savior. It's in John, and it's in chapter 14, and it's verse 28. You have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If you love me, you would rejoice, because I said, I go unto the Father, for my Father is greater than I. First Corinthians 15 says when all of this thing is ended and we stand at the throne of God, Jesus is going to take everything, all the crowns, everything, and hand them back to the Father. For that's where they belong. When the apostle said, when are you coming back? I don't know. The Father has reserved that to himself. Who's going to sit on either side? I don't know. The Father hasn't said. And the humility of the one who said, I thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but I made it no reputation. People say to me all the time, why isn't he called all those names in Isaiah 9? I said, he laid them down. He laid them down. And he pointed us to the Father. In his prayer, when they said, teach us to pray, he said, you say, our Father. 
I hear preachers pray all the time. I hear Christians pray all the time. They pray to God or they pray to the Lord or they pray, 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 pray. He said, say, our Father. That seems simple enough to me to obey. He said, say it. No, oh, well, he didn't mean it. <laughs> Ooh. I was up witnessing on an airplane, and this guy, after a little while, he said, you, you just believe the Bible. I said, I do. He said, do you believe the story of Lot? I said, yeah. He said, you believe she turned to a pillar of stone, a pillar of salt? I said, yeah, you could have used her on the supper table if you'd have had a shaker. He said, man, you do believe it, don't you? I said, I do. He says, you know what I believe? He, this was a preacher. He said, I believe that what God meant to say is her mind crystallized. That's what he said. I said, you think God could say her mind crystallized? He said, yeah, of course. I said, wonder why he didn't. He said, I never thought of that. <laughs> I was, when Ms., my second wife was in a coma for a long time and then never could do very much the whole time, but I was sitting in a laundromat one day because I had to be a mom and daddy both and and uh, I was doing laundry. Now, I had got, er got everything in machines, and I would sat down on the table where you fold clothes there, and I was reading my Bible and had on some old Western clothes like I always wear and boots and a hat, and two fellas walked in. They all have the same last name, Elder. <laughs> and they came over to me and said, you're reading the Bible. I said, I certainly am. Yes, sir. They said, well, maybe we could help you understand that book. I said, boy, I'm open. <laughs> and they said, and they turned, I knew where they was going. They was going over to the Old Testament, you know, and the staff that's mentioned there. Uh, and uh, they said, uh, th th this is Joseph Smith. I said, the Bible doesn't say Smith. They said, that's Joseph Smith. I said, the Bible doesn't say Smith. They said, that's Joseph Smith. I said, the Bible don't say Smith. <laughs> One of them stood up, boy, and he stretched out about as tall as he could, and he said, I testify to you, that's Joseph Smith. And I stood up about as high as I could, and I said, I testify to you, you a liar. I'm going to tell you, if the book don't say Smith, it ain't Smith. Yeah. I had a nephew in World War II. He served under General George Patton. A lot of you won't remember that name. He was a great general. He earned the name because of his bravery of blood and guts. Alvin Coos, my nephew by marriage, said, I'm telling you, we came up to the Rhine River. The Germans were encased across the river with their machine guns and everything. He said, General Patton stripped down his uniform, took off his boots, dove in the river, and swam under enemy fire, the Rhine River. Turned around and swam back. Crawled up on the bank and said, follow me. 
He said, sir, I would have died any minute of the day for that man. Would you stand to your feet tonight?